The desert air hung heavy that night. June in Beverly Hills, you know? It's usually a time for fancy parties and sunshine, but not this night. This night, the only warmth came from the blood pooling on the carpet. Bugsy Siegel, the man who dreamed of turning this dusty town into a gambler's paradise, lay dead. A bullet-riddled testament to the dangerous game he played. He built an empire, sure, but empires built on blood have a funny way of collapsing. They found him in Virginia Hill's living room, his girlfriend, a dame as beautiful as she was dangerous. Some say she knew, some say she didn't. Either way, she wasn't talking. He wasn't born Bugsy, he was born Benjamin Siegel, a Jewish kid from Brooklyn, Williamsburg to be exact, tough streets, the kind of place that chews up good intentions and spits out survivors. He was a young man in a hurry, always looking for an angle, a way to prove himself. He found it in the streets, running with a crew of tough guys, guys with names like Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano. They called him Bugsy because of his temper, said he was two steps away from crazy. But he was smart, see? Ambitious, and he had a knack for violence, a dangerous combination. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the 1910s, a melting pot of immigrants, all scrapping for a piece of the American dream. But for young Benjamin Siegel, the dream was a nightmare. Poverty, violence, the constant threat of something worse just around the corner. He learned to fight before he could read, learned to hustle before he could count. The streets were his classroom, the gangs, his teachers. He was a tough kid, even tougher because he had to be. He saw the Irish gangs, the Italian gangs, carving up the neighborhood, taking what they wanted. He knew he didn't belong to their world. He was different, Jewish, an outsider. But he also knew one thing, respect is earned, not given. Lansky was a thinker, Siegel, the muscle. They complemented each other, two sides of the same coin. They started small, petty theft, protection rackets, nothing too fancy, but they were learning. The Lower East Side became their classroom. They learned from the old timers, the seasoned criminals who ran the streets. But Siegel, he wasn't content with just following. He wanted to lead, he craved power, and he wasn't afraid to use violence to get it. They formed their own gang, a mix of Jewish and Italian boys, all hungry for a piece of the action. They called themselves the Bugs Meyer Gang, a name whispered on the streets with a mix of fear and respect. Word spread fast. The Bugs Meyer Gang were the ones to go to for muscle, for intimidation, for getting things done. They built a reputation, a brand, and that brand was fear. But Siegel, he was different. He had a flair, a charisma. He liked the finer things in life, sharp clothes, beautiful women, he stood out in a world of grimy back rooms and smoky speakeasies. He was a natural leader, but his temper, that was a problem. A hair trigger, unpredictable. People started calling him Bugsy, short for Bugs, as in crazy. He hated the name, but it stuck. The 1920s roared, jazz, booze, and a whole lot of crime. The mafia they were organizing, becoming a real corporation, and Bugsy, with his brains and his brawn, he was a valuable asset. Lucky Luciano, he saw the future. No more petty rivalries. He wanted to unite the families, create a national syndicate, and to do that, he needed to eliminate the competition, the old guard, guys like Joe the Boss Masseria. Bugsy, with his reputation for violence, he was the perfect weapon. One of four gunmen hired to take out Masseria. A restaurant hit, brutal, efficient, a message sent. The old ways were dying. The new order was rising. Bugsy thrived in this new world. He was making more money than he ever dreamed of, but it wasn't enough. He wanted more, more power, more respect, and he was willing to do whatever it took to get it. The syndicate needed muscle, enforcers, guys who could make problems disappear. That's how Murder Incorporated was born, a shadowy group of killers for hire. And Bugsy, he was one of their most lethal assets. They operated in the shadows, ruthless, efficient, no witnesses. Their victims, rival gangsters, informants, anyone who crossed the syndicate. Fear was their currency. And Bugsy was their most feared collector. He was a natural at it. The violence that simmered beneath the surface, it found an outlet. He was cold, calculating, 
a different person than the charming gangster who rubbed shoulders with Hollywood stars. But the constant bloodshed took its toll. The lines between right and wrong they blurred. He was losing himself in a world of darkness, and the shadows were closing in. New York was getting too hot. The heat was on, the feds were sniffing around. Bugsy needed a change of scenery, a new playground. He set his sights on the West Coast, California, land of sunshine and opportunity. He relocated his rackets, bootlegging, gambling, extortion. He brought his crew out from New York, guys like Mickey Cohen, tough Jews, ready to carve out their piece of the pie. He set up shop in Los Angeles, made connections with the Hollywood elite, stars, studio heads, politicians. He was living the high life, mansions, fancy cars, beautiful women. He was on top of the world. But the East Coast, it never really leaves you. He was still answering to the syndicate, still doing their dirty work. And they had plans for him, big plans. Plans that would take him to the middle of the desert, to a dusty little town called Las Vegas. Bugsy loved Hollywood, the glamour, the excitement. He rubbed elbows with movie stars, went to all the right parties. He even had a brief stint as a technical advisor on a gangster film. Life imitating art, or was it the other way around? He started dating Virginia Hill, a beauty, a firecracker. Some called her a gold digger. Others said she was as ruthless as he was. They were a match made in gangster heaven. But beneath the surface, there was trouble. The syndicate was unhappy with Bugsy's Hollywood lifestyle. They thought he was getting too big for his britches, spending too much time with actors and actresses, not enough time making money. They needed a new plan, a new way to legitimize their operations. Their eyes fell on a dusty little town in the middle of the Nevada desert, Las Vegas, a wide open town, ripe for the picking. And they knew just the man to build their empire, Bugsy Siegel. Las Vegas, 1945, a dusty little town in the middle of nowhere, a stopover for gamblers and tourists on their way to somewhere else. But Bugsy, he saw something different. He saw potential. He saw the future, the syndicate. They had their hooks in everything else, booze, gambling, numbers. But Vegas, this was different. This was a chance to build something legitimate, a playground for adults, a place where anything goes. They gave him the green light and a small fortune to make it happen. Bugsy, he was in his element, dreaming big, building something from nothing. He envisioned a palace in the desert, a place of luxury and excitement a place where people could forget their troubles and lose themselves in the moment. He called it the Flamingo, named after Virginia Hill, his fiery redhead. She loved the birds, and Bugsy, he loved her. It was gonna be his masterpiece, his ticket to the big time. He just didn't know it was also gonna be his downfall. Construction began, a hive of activity in the middle of the desert. Palm trees were imported, marble shipped in from Italy. Bugsy spared no expense. He wanted the Flamingo to be the most glamorous hotel in the world. He was obsessed, every detail, every fixture. He pushed his crews hard, demanding perfection. He was a man possessed, driven by a vision only he could see. The Flamingo was more than just a hotel. It was a statement, a symbol of Bugsy's ambition. He was gonna show the world what a Jewish kid from Brooklyn could do. He was gonna build something that would last. But the desert, it's a fickle mistress. The heat, the dust, the isolation. It played tricks on your mind. And Bugsy, with his temper and his paranoia, he was starting to unravel. The budget, it ballooned. Materials were scarce. World War II had just ended and everyone was rebuilding. Costs skyrocketed. Bugsy, he dipped into the syndicate's funds, took out loans from anyone who'd lend him money. The bosses back east, they were getting restless. Millions of dollars poured into the desert and still no opening date in sight. They sent their enforcers out to see what was going on. Guys like Gus Greenbaum, tough Jews, loyal to the syndicate. They found a chaotic construction site, delays, cost overruns, and Bugsy holed up in his suite, surrounded by blueprints and empty bottles, losing his grip. They warned him, shape up or ship out. The syndicate didn't tolerate failure, but Bugsy, he was too far gone. He'd tasted the good life, the power, the glamour. He couldn't go back. He had to make the flamingo work, no matter the cost. The flamingo finally opened, 
December 1946, a star-studded affair. Hollywood came out in full force, Clark Gable, Lana Turner, even Bugsy's old pal George Raft. It was a night to remember, but the glitter couldn't hide the cracks. The casino? It was a flop. The gamblers, they didn't come. The desert, it was too far, too quiet. They preferred the bright lights and familiar faces of Reno. Bugsy was losing control. His temper flared. He lashed out at everyone. Virginia, his crew, even the high rollers he was so desperate to attract. The pressure was getting to him, and the walls were closing in. The syndicate had seen enough. They'd invested millions. And Bugsy, he was bleeding them dry. He'd become a liability, a loose cannon. They made a decision, a cold, calculated decision. Bugsy had to go. The flamingo was hemorrhaging money, a beautiful bleeding bird in the middle of the desert. Every day, it lost more cash than it took in. The syndicate, they were patient men, but their patience had limits. They'd sent their message, loud and clear. Bugsy, he knew he was living on borrowed time, but he was a gambler, always had been. He thought he could turn it around. One big win, one lucky break. That's all he needed. He tried everything, brought in new games, hired the best dealers, courted the biggest whales, but nothing worked. The desert, it was unforgiving, and the odds, they were stacked against him. He was running out of time, and he knew it. The shadows were getting longer. The whispers in the hallways grew louder. He was a marked man, and the hunters were closing in. The whispers turned into rumors, rumors of a double cross, a betrayal. The syndicate, they didn't forgive, and they didn't forget. Bugsy, he'd crossed a line, skimmed off the top, lined his own pockets. Lansky, his old friend, his partner in crime, he couldn't save him. Some say he tried, others say he gave the order himself. The truth, it died with Bugsy that night. They say there was a meeting, a last ditch effort to salvage the situation. Bugsy, he pleaded his case, begged for another chance. But the bosses, they'd already made up their minds. The desert, it was a lonely place to die, miles from nowhere, Surrounded by sand and secrets, Bugsy, he knew the score. He'd played the game, and now it was time to pay the price. June 20th, 1947, a hot summer night. Bugsy was at Virginia's house, a sprawling mansion in Beverly Hills. He thought he was safe here, away from the desert, away from the flamingo, away from the ghosts of his past. He was wrong. The assassin, he came in the night, a shadowy figure, a ghost himself. He waited for the right moment, the moment when Bugsy let his guard down, the moment when death came knocking. A burst of gunfire shattered the night. Bullets ripped through the window, through the curtains, through flesh and bone. Bugsy never had a chance. He died instantly, slumped in a chair, a book of poetry in his lap. The killer, he melted into the night, leaving behind a trail of blood and unanswered questions. The cops, they came. The reporters, they swarmed. But the truth, it was already gone, swallowed by the darkness. Another casualty in the city of dreams. The Flamingo, it became a legend, a monument to Bugsy's ambition and his folly. The syndicate they took over, ironed out the kinks, turned it into a money-making machine. But Bugsy, he was gone, erased from the picture. His name, it was whispered in hushed tones, a cautionary tale, a reminder that even in the city of dreams, nightmares could come true. Las Vegas, it thrived, became the gambling capital of the world, a neon oasis in the desert, built on the backs of dreamers and schemers and the blood of men like Bugsy Siegel. His legacy, a footnote in the history of organized crime, a tragic hero, a victim of his own ambition. He built the dream, but he never got to live it, he died young, gunned down in his prime, a king without a crown, a gambler who bet it all and lost. They called him a visionary, a dreamer, a gangster with a touch of Hollywood glamour. Bugsy Siegel, the man who tried to build paradise in the desert. But empires built on sand have a funny way of crumbling. Did he invent Vegas? Not really. Gambling was already here. But he saw the potential, the wide open spaces, the lack of rules. He wanted to create something bigger, grander, a place where anything went. He failed. Of course he failed. The Flamingo, it was a financial disaster. 
a monument to his ego. But sometimes failures can inspire greater things. The syndicate, they learned from his mistakes. They built their empire on his ashes. So no, Bugsy Siegel didn't invent Vegas, but he left his mark on it. A blood stain on the green felt, a reminder that even in the city of dreams, nightmares can come true. Bugsy was a product of his environment. The streets of Williamsburg, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression. He learned to fight to survive, learned that money and power were the only things that mattered. He was a gambler, through and through. He took risks, lived on the edge, pushed his luck too far. He bet big on the Flamingo, bet his life on it, and lost. Was it inevitable? Maybe. The life he chose, it had consequences. He made enemies, powerful enemies. And in the end, they caught up with him. He died young, gunned down in his prime, just like so many others who dared to play the game. He was a cautionary tale, a reminder that the house always wins.